All right, everybody, hello and welcome to this A plus 1101 practice exam for exam objective 1.2. In this video, we're gonna go through pretty much everything you need to know for exam objective 1.2. I'm gonna tell you what you're going to probably be asked on that exam. I'm also gonna give you some practice exam questions. And what we're gonna look at today is right here, exam objective 1.2, compare and contrast the display components of mobile devices. So we're gonna go through the different types of displays for mobile devices, which will include, of course, liquid crystal display and the different types of that. So you've got in-plane switching or IPS, twisted pneumatic or TN, and vertical alignment or VA. You've also got organic light emitting diode, which is OLED. We'll go through all of those in this YouTube video here. We're then gonna go through the mobile display components, the Wi-Fi antenna connector placement, the camera webcam, the microphone, touch screen slash digitizer, and of course the inverter. Gonna give you practice questions on all of these, gonna explain all of those answers to those practice questions, and I'm gonna tell you what you're probably gonna be asked for each one of those dot points. So we're gonna be sweet after this video today, guys. You are gonna just like have the perfect idea of what to do when it comes to the exam. So let's go ahead and get started straight away with question number one. You are considering purchasing a new monitor and have been researching the different types of display technologies available. You're particularly interested in getting accurate colors and a good balance between performance and quality. Which type of LCD display technology should you consider based on your requirements? A. TN B. IPS C. VA or D. OLED The answer is B, IPS, otherwise known as in-plane switching. Now, as to why that's the answer, let's take a little look at our explanation here. We've got basically just an outline of each different display type, what each one is good at, what each one isn't so good at, and the ideal use for each display type. So first up, we've got IPS or in-plane switching. Uh, and in-plane switching displays are the best technology for color representation and viewing angles, making it a good choice for graphic designers and video editors, right? So in-plane switching, you're looking at really good color representation. If you're a graphic designer, if you're a video editor, you need to make sure you've got those colors on point and that the color representation is accurate so that you don't think you have the colors right and then you send your product off and it turns out the colors on the customer end is actually not correct when they print it out, right? So that's why it's really important for those kind of uh, work, the people that work in those industries, you want to implant switching ideally. Good color representation and good viewing angles. Then we have our twisted pneumatic displays and they are the best display for response time. So really, really fast response times. This makes them a good choice for gamers. So if you're a gamer, you're trying to get as many frames per second in as you possibly can. You're trying to make sure that, you know, you've got that perfect reaction time. Someone's going to snipe you. No, they're not. Move your head. Boom. You're dead, buddy. If you want that kind of performance, you need really, really a good response time. And for that, you're looking at a twisted pneumatic display. The next one, VA displays are a good in-between option. So vertical alignment displays, they kind of do good at everything like a jack of all trades, but not really, really fantastic at any one particular thing. So if you don't want to spend the money on an IPS display, but you still want to get decent color representation, then you, you know, a VA, a vertical alignment display is a pretty good in-between option. And finally, OLED displays are the only option listed that is not an LCD display. OLED displays are a different technology that use organic matter, which provides its own light. So essentially what this means is it emits its own light, right? The LCD displays, they have a backlight that needs to be active and lit up in order for the content to be visible. But OLED displays provide their own light. The actual individual matter of the display is lighting itself up when it's connected to power. And this is most commonly used for things like wearable watches, uh, you know, when you go running for smartwatches, things to that effect. So if you ever get a question asking what technology is used in this smartwatch, it's gonna be OLED. The answer is gonna be OLED. There's really no question about that. It is OLED. If it's wearable, put it on your wrist, that's OLED. And you can see here a really good table that I pulled straight out of my learning guide for the A plus 1101 that you can purchase yourself at journeytocyber.com. Uh, you can see, <laughs> you gotta do a plug, you gotta do it guys. You can see uh, a good breakdown of the pros and cons of each different display type and the ideal, ideal use for each display type. So you can have a look at that 
right there. So I'm not gonna go through that because that's pretty much what I just went through with you guys, but that is right there if you wanna pause the video and have a look. Now, you might also be asked on this topic to choose the best display based on a given scenario. You might be asked to explain the difference between display types, and you might be asked to identify the type of display being used in a scenario. More likely than not, what they're gonna have you do for this is they're gonna say, look, Max is playing video games, which display type is most appropriate for him to choose. You know, something like that. They'll give you a scenario and they'll have you try and figure out which display type is best for that given scenario. Or they might say, you know, which display type is best known for its color representation, something to that effect, right? That's the kind of questions you're gonna be asked for that part of that exam objective. Moving on to the next question, let's take a look. Which of the following best describes the difference between CCFL backlights and LED backlights? A, CCFL backlights are older technology that is not commonly used anymore, while LED is used regularly in modern devices. B, LED backlights are older technology that is not commonly used anymore, while CCFL is used regularly in modern devices. C, CCFL backlights are significantly thicker. D, LED backlights are significantly thicker. And the answer is A, CCFL backlights are older technology that is not commonly used anymore, while LED is used regularly in modern devices. So let's go ahead and take a look at that explanation for this one. Uh, the explanation, CCFL is an older technology and is very thick, and LED is a modern technology that is much thinner and more lightweight. Now you might be thinking, but one of the answers there said that um, CCFL was thicker, so shouldn't that be correct? Kind of, there's two factors that went into that. The first one is, I don't think I thought through enough how I quickly wrote this question out for this video, but also, you've gotta um, take a look at the question. The question says, which of the following best describes the difference? So there might be two that sound like they kinda of describe the difference, but you're looking for which one best describes the difference. And option number C, CCFL backlights are significantly thicker, it's true, but it's a simple kind of one sentence descriptor that is correct, but it it's a very simple outline, right? Whereas answer number, doo -doo -doo, which one was it? Um, a, <laughs> answer number A uh, is much more detailed. So CCFL backlights are older and not commonly used anymore, while LED is regularly used in modern devices. So it's a much more accurate description. So sometimes you will get two questions that both seem like they might be correct, you have to be able to differentiate and figure out which one is the most correct. And in this situation, option A is the most correct, the most detailed, the most accurate answer. So that's why A is correct there. Now, you might also be asked, based on a given scenario, what type of display is being used. So again, they might say, you know, Max is using an older device with uh, thick backlights. What type of display is this? And you might also be asked to choose the most appropriate display type based on given requirements. So they might give you some requirements. They might say, you know, um, we'll go with Max again. He is looking for a display that is thin and modern. Which display type should he choose? And of course, in that situation, you'd want to have him choose LED because that's the thin and modern type of display. Alrighty, guys, we're getting there. We're getting there today. We're doing really well. Let's move on to the next question and see how we go. What component is located at the top of the display on a laptop? A, wireless card, B, antenna, C, NIC, D, SODIM. The answer is B, antenna. So guys, the antenna is wired around the inside of the display all the way up the top. And the reason for that is simple. Uh, at the top of the display, you just get the best signal. It's like when you're not getting a signal on your phone, we all do it, you hold your phone up high and just hope to God that he does something with you when you hold your phone up high. But intuitively, we're holding our phone up high because we're gonna get a bit of signal the higher we go, right? So same thing in a laptop, the higher that wire is, the better signal you're gonna get. That's why the antenna is wired up the top of the display. Now some questions that you might also be asked, what is the Wi-Fi antenna used for? and what components are required in order for a Wi-Fi antenna to provide a wireless connection. So with that last one, think about, you know, do you just need an antenna? What other components do you need? Maybe you also need, I don't know, a, a wireless card, for example, because an antenna is great to get a signal, but if you don't have 
any component within the laptop that can actually turn that signal into a, a access to the network connection, it's not going to be very, uh, much good to you. You need all relevant components to work together. So that's what you might be asked in your exam, things to that effect. Let's move on to the next question. If you're noticing that the video has changed, that's because my phone died and I had to switch my DSLR camera and it's like wonkily like shoved into a pencil case to get it to stand up. So that is why that's changed over here. That being said, <laughs> let's go ahead and get to the next question. Mr. Graham is interested in purchasing a laptop for engaging in video conferences. What combination of components should he ensure the laptop has? A, a microphone and headset. B, OLED and streaming technology. C, camera and microphone. D, twisted, nomadic, and a RAID controller. And the answer is C, camera and microphone. So let's go ahead and have a look at why that's the answer right now. So in order to engage in video conferences, you require both video and audio. And this combination is the only one that provides these capabilities. So in short, guys, the other answers either provided audio and something else or video and something else. None of the other answers provided both video and audio. It put simply, if you're going to have a video conference, you need a camera and a microphone. So what else might you be asked in relation to this? Let's take a look. You might be asked, where is the video, uh, where is the camera slash microphone located? Where is the microphone located or where is the camera located? And of course, they are at the top of the laptop for the most part, unless you have a separate USB one. So they're located at the top of the display. You might also be asked, given a scenario, solve issues relating to microphones and webcams. So an example of this might be if someone's laptop isn't working, but they don't want to send their laptop in to get repaired, what is a potential workaround? Well, let's have a think. They could plug in a portable USB laptop as a temporary or even potentially a permanent replacement if that's something they want to do. That's a potential workaround there. So things like that. How do you get around audio and keyboard issues? All right, guys, we're almost there. We're really getting to the end of this exam objective. Let's take a look at the next question, which is, Matt tries to use his touchscreen device, but it does not respond to his fingers or his touch pen. What technology has failed? A, input array. B, digitizer. C, digital interface. D, manual input release. And the answer is B, digitizer. Now guys, essentially the digitizer is the piece of technology within the device that when you take your finger and you touch it and that makes the device do things, the digitizer is what allows that to happen. So digitizers are used in touchscreen technology. If you are touching something, if you're touching a screen and something on the screen is happening, that's because of a digitizer. So if you go to touch it with your finger, if you go to touch that screen and nothing happens and there's an issue, that more than likely means there's a problem with the digitizer. If you don't have any additional information and the touch screen isn't working, according to the, the questions you're gonna be asked, it's a safe bet to say that the digitizer is faulty or there's an issue with the digitizer, okay? So that brings us to the kind of questions that you might be asked for this uh, section on exam objective 1.2. You might be asked, what is a digitizer responsible for? You might also be asked, given a scenario, does the person require a digitizer? Do they even need it? Right? It might be unnecessary money to spend. Um, the question might be something to the effect of James wants a laptop to type in a Microsoft Word doc uh, so that he can work on his side hustle when he's not at work and he's on the train. Does he need a digitizer for this? And of course not. He doesn't need a touchscreen to work on Google Docs. So, you know, those are the kind of things you're going to have to consider when it comes to the digitizer. So let's take a look at the next question, the final question for this exam objective. Uh, and see how we go. So, final question, let's do it. You have been using your laptop regularly, but suddenly the screen goes completely dark. You suspect there might be an issue with the display. Remembering some troubleshooting tips, you decide to perform a quick test. You shine a flashlight at the screen and notice that you can faintly see the contents of the screen. What could be the potential cause of this issue? A, the graphics card has failed, B, the display cable is loose. C, the inverter has likely failed. D, 
the RAM modules need replacement? The answer is C, the inverter has likely failed. Now let's go into why this is the case. The explanation, the inverter converts AC power to DC power and if an inverter fails, the backlights will stop working, they'll stop receiving power and therefore they'll, they'll stop working, they'll stop producing light, right? So the content is still being produced on the screen, it's just that there's no light there to make it available for your eyes to actually see it. So by shining a flashlight on that screen, you're simply illuminating the content that is there. So that's why that little test works and if you don't have any content in your screen, it's a black screen and you shine a flashlight at it and you can see it, it's a safe bet that it's because the inverter has failed. Now, you might also be asked a couple of these questions. What does an inverter do? What is it responsible for? Of course, now we know it converts AC power to DC power. Uh, you might also be asked, of course, based on a given scenario, is the inverter functioning? Based on a scenario that they give you, is the inverter working? Is it the inverter that is faulty or is it something else that is faulty? So you need to be prepared to answer those questions. All right, guys, and that is it for this exam objective. If you flew through this, if you smashed it, that means you're ready for the exam. If you had some difficulties, that's okay. You know where you need to focus your efforts in. And speaking of needing some help studying, if you want to get comprehensive notes broken down by exam objective, active recall questions, uh, scenario-based questions with specific answers and learning activities for every individual learning objective, exam objective of the exam, broken down, as you can see, not only into the exam objective, but also into the separate dot points of that exam objective, head over to journeytocyber.com. You can grab my stuff there. So if you found value in this video, if you like this video, you know what to do. Head to journeytocyber.com and grab your learning guide there. Alternatively, you know, you got these free videos, so that's fine, but hey, I gotta do my plug. Now, over at Journey to Cyber, you can also get a free practice exam, completely free, no catch. You just head over there, download it, to see if you're ready for the real thing. So with that, I'll leave you guys to it, and I'll see you in the next installment to do our practice exam on exam objective 1.3. All right, see you next time.